but we're using our rod-shaped cells in our eyes. We're using scotopic vision, and as a consequence, we are seeing the Whirlpool galaxy and every other galaxy in 2200, blurry, and in um, colorblind, because faint uh, vision is always colorblind. So it doesn't resemble those beautiful images with uh, astonishing detail and gorgeous color with those uh, co- uh, cobalt-colored uh, spiral arms and the campfire-colored cores of galaxies that we see in, let's say, magazine photographs. But with SLU, uh, you see it because all of it, even though it's live astronomy, you see the true detail and the true color. So even if you have a backyard telescope, this is, a, I think, an important supplement for exploring the universe. And uh, I don't want to get too obnoxious and keep raving about SLU. Uh, so let's turn back to this live lunar eclipse we're looking at. And I think maybe Duncan and I will talk a little bit about uh, the moon that we're looking at. I mean, obviously, we're watching a round body. But let me tell you how round it is. The moon, when you look up in the night sky, when it's uh, perfectly full, you are looking at perfect roundness because the moon is only one part in 500 out of round. It's 2,160 miles across, and it's only four miles from that deviating from a from a perfect circle, and no eye can discern that. So just as the sun is perfectly round, the moon is also one of the few perfectly round things that the eye can ever see. Kind of cool. It's- it's beautiful. Hey, Bob, I, I want to ask a question. Um, it, c- can I see some stars here? Do, do you see... Uh, well, I, are, are, I, are we picking out some stars? Uh, there seems uh, to be one very close to the limb at about sort of four o'clock-ish. That's right. I see some, and I believe that we, uh, we are seeing uh, stars there, yes, uh, because we've now changed the exposure to capture this dimmer moon, and we're, we're seeing background stars. And uh, those who have... Uh, are in position to see the moon right now. That is, if you're in the Middle East or Asia, and it uh, may even be happening for you around now. Isn't it around uh, twilight or sunset uh, for you, Duncan, in London? Yeah, it is. It's, about, it's, it's just, just after 9 o'clock here. So we, we, we've got a, we're almost at the longest day, so it's, it's still quite light outside. Okay. Well, the, the uh, moon is... Uh, it's always fascinating that the full moon is opposite the sun in the sky. A lot of people don't realize that, so that as the sun is setting, that's just when the full moon rises, when the sun is at its lowest, at around midnight, or 1 o'clock during daylight time, or summertime as they call it in England. That's when the uh, moon uh, is at its highest, just when the sun is lowest, at around midnight. So it's, everything is opposite the sun. And uh, so in London there, where the sun is... Uh, Close to setting, that's when this moon will rise. It's very easy to predict. Another thing about the full moon is that it's even opposite in every possible way. This time of year, as Duncan just pointed out, is when the sun is highest in the sky. We're only, uh, what, a week or so from the summer solstice when the sun is highest. Well, that means any full moon at this time of year will be the lowest full moon of the year. It'll have the lowest path through the sky. We'll see it through the thickest air near the horizon and maybe that's the origin to that term honeymoon because um, weddings were for a long time traditional in june i understand that these days september is the most common month for weddings but it was june for a lot of months and maybe that's where the the term honeymoon comes from yeah, uh, fascinating well, let's throw other moon facts uh, at us we already said uh, uh, just over 2,000 miles from side to side. So if you place the moon, let's say, over the United States with the right side over, let's say, Boston or New York, the left side of the moon would just about be over Denver, uh, Colorado, that area, just so you get a sense of what kind of size that we're talking about. And with its density, which is not it, it's not as crammed full of stuff as Earth is. Its density is about 3.3 grams per cubic centimeter. You take a little sugar cube worth of uh, substance of the moon, and it's going to weigh about three and a third grams. Earth, on average, weighs five and a half grams, so we're, we're, we're the denser body. And uh, so if you add that together, it means that the moon weighs 81 times less than Earth. You need 81 moons to equal the just the sheer weight of, uh, of the Earth. So always interesting to... Uh, get a sense of uh, what we're looking at with the moon. We're also looking at one of the 
darkest objects in the known universe. Now, maybe it's odd to talk about that now because it's uh, uh, it's an eclipse, of course, that we're seeing. In fact, the very middle of the eclipse is only about a minute and a half or two minutes from now, the central part of the eclipse. But we're looking at a object that is as dark as black paint or close to it. Hard to believe that if you took uh, the moon and wanted to compare it to an object on Earth, the nearest thing you could find would be asphalt, a parking lot. Hmm. Uh, so if some insane developer went to the moon and, 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 and paved it, turned it into an entire parking lot, uh, paved it with asphalt, the truth is it would be no darker than it already looks in the night sky. It's got a reflectivity of of only 12%. It bounces only 12% of the sunlight that hits it. Black paint is about um, 10%, so it's pretty darn dark. And uh, speaking of that, all of this uh, has taken us to right now the midpoint of this lunar eclipse. We're right in the middle of it now. And and so, Duncan, we, we, can, we can look at it and decide whether there is any asymmetry or irregularity. What do you, what do you think? What are we looking uh, at? Well, I, first of all, I think it's absolutely beautiful, and the image we're getting back here now is, is, is stunning. And uh, as I say, I'm, I, I'm, I'm deep in the bowels of the, of the Mayflower Studios here in Soho, and, and I, I can't see outside, but what I can see on my, my little laptop here is this wonderful image. Uh, it looks to be pretty even to me, Bob. It does to me, too. A little bit of a surprise that we're getting such a normal eclipse since we've had such uh, uh, you know, a spate of volcanoes erupting, and normally that'll make it for a blacker eclipse than usual since the light that's hitting the moon, we said this earlier, but it bears repeating, is the light from the edge of Earth so that if you were on the moon now looking back, you'd be seeing no sunlight because the sun is behind the Earth in the sky. The Earth is just inky black, but it's surrounded by a red ring of all the world's sunrises and sunsets, and that ring of fire is what's illuminating the moon at the moment. But that ring doesn't have to be symmetrical. Very often, if part of uh, Earth is more polluted, cloudier, have volcanic eruptions, you'll get one section of that ring that'll be darker than the rest, and therefore the light that's bent or refracted onto the moon's surface will will make for one part of the moon to be darker than the rest. Instead, we're seeing a pretty darn even redness on the moon, and uh, that means despite these volcanoes and despite all the bad news in the newspapers, uh, Earth is normal. Pretty amazing shot, isn't it? Look at that. Uh, it's gorgeous. We're we're now at uh, mid eclipse. Uh, just uh, absolutely stunning. The moon is going to shift its position. You know, Duncan, you were talking about the background stars. I, we see one just to the right of the moon. Yeah. There's another yeah. star above it. Maybe we should point out that the moon moves through space, uh, one diameter uh, per hour, and the moon is a uh, half degree in size, and that surprises a lot of people because. Most people remember the moon as being larger than it really is. I've found that if you ask friends, and just ask people who are not astronomers, uh, to rate the size of the moon, and of course, since people don't know how to use degrees in their mind, you you could put the question this way. If you were to stack full moons, one, one atop the other, how many moons do you think it would take to stretch from the horizon, the skyline, to straight overhead, the zenith? How, how, How many moons would it take? And that's a way for people to uh, assess their recollections of the size of the moon. And most people, I've found, will say something like 40 or 50 or 60 moons. The real answer is 180 moons are required to stretch from the horizon to the zenith. Since there are 90 degrees in that span, it means the moon must be half a degree. Same size as the sun, and it's another... Uh, astonishing coincidence, if you believe in coincidences, that we only have two disks in our size, we, in our skies. We were just talking about how um, both the uh, sun and the moon appear perfectly round. Those are two of the only round shapes we ever commonly see. And these two disks are both the exact same apparent size. That's why the moon so perfectly fits over the sun for those spectacular solar eclipses. It's not larger, substantially larger. It's not 
smaller, and if it is, sometimes during the far part of its orbit, it's just barely smaller. They're really the same size disks, and if either the sun or the moon were nearer or farther or larger or smaller, you wouldn't have that. And we didn't used to have that because the moon used to be closer to us. And since it's spiraling away from us at the rate of one and a half inches a year, we're not going to have it in the distant future. So it's only really for now when humans are on Earth that we have the moon and the sun being the same size in our sky. Uh, Another thing that people used to think was almost a sign, a divine sign, and, you know, a lot of people uh, turn to astronomers for their religious beliefs. For some reason, Duncan, I know you've had this as well. People think astronomers have uh, some sort of extra handle on the uh, <laughs> on the nature of the universe. And uh, I wish I did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, people always are trying to figure out whether the universe has some uh, divine plan or whether it's random. And uh, off, people often look to astronomy for that. And uh, they used to uh, think that one sign of a strange divine co- uh, plan, rather than a coincidence, is the fact that the moon spins in the same period in which it goes around us. Its uh, orbital period is um, 27.32166 days. I have to remember these things exactly. And its period of rotation is the same thing, uh, 27.32166 days. And uh, people would say, well, what are the chances of that happening? But now we know that even though the sun-moon same size business is really either an amazing coincidence, uh, there, there's no reason for it, but uh, this other business isn't because we've found only in the last few decades that every moon of every planet has the same spin rate as its orbital period around its parent planet. Or put another way, every single moon faces has one side that faces its parent planet. So our moon is not the oddball. It's not an oddity. Tidal forces have done this to absolutely every moon uh, in the solar system. So there it is. There's the same features that we always see because that's the side that always faces us. I think that's a really interesting point you raise there, Bob, because it, it, it's one of those points that as we learn more and more, as we learn more about the universe around us, what once appeared to be unique and special actually perhaps isn't as unique or special as we thought it was or wanted it to be. And the same goes with things such as planets, exoplanets around other stars. It's always in, it's incredible to me to think that 15, 20 years ago, we only knew of nine planets around our sun. Now there's a plethora of them out there. I think, you know, getting on to close to a thousand. That's right. Even though, more... even though we lost Pluto, the others yeah. have more than made up for it. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. But we're getting this. Uh, I'm just seeing the feed now from Dubai, uh, the live feed from du- Dubai here, and it's absolutely stunning. It looks like we're, we're right in the the darkest part of this of, yes. the, of the Earth's shadow. There, it's beautiful. We're, we're right at mid eclipse. Now, what we're going to have we're going to have our next guest on, and I uh, hope you'll stay with us, Duncan, because I'd you love will to. you will understand her. Uh, uh, since you're both from the same part of the world, we won't need the subtitles. We've been running subtitles so far over the uh, the images for the for your British accent, but uh, you two will not need it. But we're going to have Lucy Green, who is a, a noted uh, astronomer, uh, expert on uh, solar astronomy. We're going to have her on at uh, in ten minutes from now, and uh, we're looking forward to that as well, as we have just now passed the midpoint of this live lunar eclipse. Uh, just, uh, you know, fantastic. Uh, Duncan and I, this is Duncan Kopp, uh, a astronomer in uh, Britain. I'm Bob Berman here in upstate New York. Lucy is also, who's going to join us, is also uh, in Britain. We'll have her on in about uh, 10 minutes. And uh, we want to thank uh, the people who made this possible. You know, a lot of people uh, had roles in this. First and foremost, there is uh, SLU. I hope you're watching this on eclipse.slu.com. And uh, it's Lou whose uh, technical work is making this live eclipse uh, possible. We also want to thank Paramount for sponsoring it and Google for presenting it as well. And uh, uh, again, if you want to see more celestial things, live astronomy, uh, definitely click on the Google site, Google, uh, or go to slu.com, and uh, there you'll find a, a way to 
become a member and see live astronomy all the time instead of just uh, during the class.